Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about how nuclear war is nothing to worry about at all. And if you just go indoors, you'll be fine. No, we're not. We're talking sensibly with someone who knows what they're talking about, about nuclear weapons. Our guest, Jackie Cabasso, has been involved in nuclear disarmament, peace, environmental and social justice advocacy at the local, national and international levels for more than 40 years. She has served as executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation since 1984. In 1995, she was a founding mother of the Abolition 2000 Global Network to eliminate nuclear weapons, where she continues to serve on its coordinating committee. She also serves as North American coordinator of Mayors for Peace and as a national co-convener of United for Peace and Justice. Jackie Cabasso was the 2008 recipient of the International Peace Bureau's Sean McBride Peace Award. Uh, Jackie Cabasso, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, thank you for everything you've been doing. Uh, I understand that the Biden administration has published a nuclear posture review. What is that? And exactly how horrible is this particular one? Well, the nuclear posture review basically sets forth uh, the conditions under which the United States would use nuclear weapons and the requirements for what kinds of nuclear weapons it thinks it's going to need for the foreseeable future. Um, the first one came out in 1994. They usually come out under every new administration. And for the first time, this is a bit interesting. It's embedded in the national defense strategy, and it's accompanied with also a missile defense posture review and the three are packaged together. So I don't know how significant that is, except that it definitely puts nuclear weapons in the context. <laughs> and yeah. how horrible is it? Well, you know, it's slightly less horrible than Trump's, but it's it's basically a, con a continuation of all of the previous ones. And in fact, it reaffirms what is obvious to me that U.S. national security policy premised on the threatened use of nuclear weapons as its cornerstone has been continuous since 1945, since President Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the U.S. atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it doesn't matter whether the government is um, dominated by Democrats or Republicans when it comes to, to nuclear weapons. Um, it really is. This particular one I would describe as a missed opportunity at a critical time. This is one of the pivot points in history when somebody, some responsible government, if there are any, needs to stand up and be the adult in the room and say, we can't keep going this way. This is the road to nowhere. There's got to be a change, but they didn't change it. So it really comes as, at this time, it's kind of like pouring gas on the fire. I wonder, Jackie Cabasso, if you could explain what this quote means, and in particular, what vital interests are Quote, the United States would only consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States and our allies and partners. <laughs> yeah, that's a great statement, isn't it? You could drive a, that's a loophole you could drive a truck through, right? Now, we don't know what the classified version says. This is the unclassified version. Perhaps there are are more uh, details in the classified version. But I read that to mean basically very much open to interpretation. U.S. vital interests certainly would include like foreign uh, deployed troops, U.S. bases around the world, which are everywhere. Um, vital interests would be any country that's considered to be a U.S. strategic ally or perhaps a country that would have things like uh, oil and other uh, natural resources that are necessary to U.S. vital interests. So it, it's pretty much open. I mean, one of the things that that it says that I think is interesting is that U.S. nuclear posture, quote, is intended to complicate an adversary's entire decision calculus 
including whether to instigate a crisis, initiate armed conflict, conduct strategic attacks using non-nuclear capabilities, or escalate to the use of nuclear weapons on any scale. So really, I think it's open to interpretation, as is the very term deterrence. What does deterrence mean? The Latin root means to terrorize. And deterrence means the threatened use of nuclear weapons. I've heard from various people that their theory is that this nuclear posture review is much worse than all the previous ones. Uh, it sounds more like there's a great deal of continuity. Yeah, I don't think it's it's not worse. I mean, it, it could not be worse than the Bush nuclear posture review, which is, which is where the famous axis of evil was identified. And seven countries were named as U.S. nuclear targets. So I don't think it's it's not quite as bad as that. And it's slightly better than Trump's. Um, but it, it, the continuity is the main thing. And I think the tone of this one is a little bit aggressive coming at this time. I mean, if it's not more aggressive than Bush or Trump. But it, again, it seems just unnecessarily aggressive. And, and just it does it's not helping. <laughs> it also identifies Russia and China as near-term um, competitor, strategic competitors and potential adversaries. It says for the first time in the 2030s, the U.S. will have two of these near-term competitors. So, you know, it's very much focused on them, but it also, you know, trains its sights on North Korea and Iran um, and says, you know, they will not be allowed if, if, if North Korea d employs a nuclear weapon, it, the regime will not survive. Iran will not be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. So it, it's positioning the United States, you know, as, as the nuclear cop, you know, instead of couching it in terms of multilateralism and, in, and internationalism and the UN and so on. I mean, this is always sort of a, a bit that gets mentioned at the end of analyses of these nuclear documents. Uh, and one question is why they're in nuclear documents. But it seems really the big deal uh, that we never get any public vote on uh, picking picking competitors and whether we need to have competitors in the first place and uh, sort of identifying competitors as enemies and, and picking enemies. I never got to vote on whether I wanted Russia or China or Iran or North Korea as an enemy. Uh, I mean, isn't this like the worst bit of this thing, even if it's not called an axis of evil? Well, sure. I mean, the, you, you never got to vote on whether the United States should have or should maintain or should modernize nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear weapons are fundamentally undemocratic and perhaps one of the most undemocratic manifestations of the of undemocracy <laughs> that we experience because nobody in any country has a, had a vote on this we don't really know what is out there in terms of of actual nuclear arsenals and capacities we have best guesses you know from from people who are, are really experts and from whistleblowers and so on but it's so the technology is so dangerous that it's it's it has to be completely secretive and guarded so it's you know you you're right on it's absolutely fundamentally undemocratic and we don't even get to vote on it indirectly because candidates don't talk about it either no, not at all. Um, uh, Jackie Cabasso, another quote from this crazy document. By the 2030s, the United States will, for the first time in history, face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries, end quote. Uh, but is that if we do everything to make that happen for the next 10 years? Or is that even if we advance peace and disarmament for the next 10 years? I mean, is this a, a self-fulfilling prediction or an objective observation? What is this? Well, they certainly don't provide like an, a set of options. If we do this, then this, you know, I'm afraid I'd have to agree with you that it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, we don't know. We don't know what would happen if the United States took a dramatically different course and said, OK, we're listen, world, things are out of hand. 
So we're going to take some leadership. The United States is announcing, let's say, we're going to cut our military budget by half. We're going to close half of our foreign military bases and stop all modernization programs. Will you come to the table? Or something. I mean, this is a ridiculous hypothetical, but I'm just saying some doing something dramatic to to sound the alarm that this is unsustainable. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Do we really want to end with, you know, a nuclear war or do we want to do things differently, you know? And this is the, the the crisis, of course, is compounded by the environmental crisis, the climate crisis. I just saw a report today um, saying that uh, an expert report coming through the UN, I, no, it was coming through the COP27, sorry, um, that would be able to have nine years to meet the climate targets or, or we're toast. So do we want to be toast from that or do we want to be toast from, you know, a nuclear war involving the US, Russia and China? I mean, it has to it has to stop. So, yes, I think I think this is certainly, let's say, a contributor to a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, Russia and China are not exactly good guys either. But, you know, somebody has to pull the, you know, blow the whistle. <laughs> yes. You you, uh, you mentioned deterrence and how it's actually a policy of terrorizing. Um, but is there actually evidence that nuclear deterrence or deterrence of any sort works? Uh, and and is there evidence that these people actually believe it works as opposed to just using it as a justification? Well, I think to answer that question, you have to ask what nuclear deterrence is, and they're actually is not uh, an agreed upon definition that everybody operates under. To me, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's commonly understood as if country A uses nuclear weapons against country B, country B will retaliate with nuclear weapons. Therefore, country A will be deterred. But that's not really what it means. Uh, according to the head of strategic command, Admiral Richard, uh, in nuclear weapons serve as a top cover or provide top cover to allow for the maneuverability of conventional forces. I think that's really important because that's what's, I think that's what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Um, it's, it, I mean, is, is that deterrence? I mean, Russia might be deterring the United States from sending troops to Ukraine. But Russia's U.S. nuclear weapons can't, you know, can't do anything in that case, right? So what does deterrence mean? I, you know, so no, there's no proof that it works. I mean, what people offer as proof as proof is they say, well, there hasn't been a major, you know, war since uh, World War II. Well, that's a, a questionable proposition anyway, but. There are dozens of major wars, yeah. <laughs> But, but but they also say if Ukraine still had nuclear weapons, Russia wouldn't be in Ukraine. What do you say to that? That that's a fallacious argument because those were Russian nuclear weapons, and Ukraine did not have operational control over them. So Russia would have had to turn over operational control to Ukraine when when the Soviet Union, um, you know, disintegrated. So that's that's just not a, that's a fallacious argument. It's also to Ukraine's credit that it was one of many countries that has said, we don't we need nuclear weapons. We don't want nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons don't make us more secure. But if Ukraine had its own nuclear weapons, which it never did, but if it had, like uh, North Korea had and Libya didn't and so forth, yeah. I mean, you can obviously say putting nuclear-capable missile bases in Poland and Romania, if you hadn't done that, you might be fine too. You know, But, but this is the argument that people will make, that if it yeah. had its own nuclear weapons, it would be safe and sound, right? Well, but if you take that... To its logical conclusion, then every country should have nuclear weapons. Really, <laughs> you know, I don't want to live in that kind of a world. I can throw a stick and hit somebody who thinks every house should be full of guns, too. I mean, it's, no, no, it's a big, it's a big question, and it's an eternal question. But you know, nuclear weapons. Though we have to remember how extraordinarily destructive they are. 
and and they really are in a different category than other weapons. And we won't survive them all, no. right. <laughs> accidents or or evil, one way or the other. If everybody's got them, we'll all die. Right. Um, and, and also, I mean, what does that mean? If you if you as a as a human being are are willing to risk destruction of others on a scale that the human imagination cannot even comprehend and which is going to blow back on you anyway what does that say about your values about the value of life you know yeah. Slight, slightly off topic maybe but i want to ask you i i saw recently that the biden administration said they would not make public what the criteria are to put somebody on the list to get blown up with a drone missile because if they did that then people would know what they had to not do to not get put on the list. This suggests to me they don't believe in deterrence whatsoever. Am, am, I, am I jumping to conclusions? I don't know. Um, I mean, this is all part of this, again, very long continuum of secrecy, non-democracy, demonization of others and so on that has um, unfortunately permeated human history and U.S. history. There's, there's recently, Jackie Cabasso, been news reports that the U.S. and Russia are actually resuming talks on nuclear disarmament, yeah. and people have taken that as wonderful news. I'm not clear how it works during the disaster of Ukraine. What, what do you know about this? Well, actually, the one... The one sort of thread <laughs> still connecting the U.S. and Russia with respect to nuclear arms control uh, is the agreement to renew the, the START treaty, which expires now in 2026. And that's the only remaining arms limitation treaty between the U.S. and Russia. Um, the Nuclear Price Review actually um, aff affirms that says that's a U.S. goal, and apparently they are starting to resume negotiations. Now, you know, international diplomacy, they're talking about secrecy. We also don't know what's going on with back channel negotiate, you know, black channel communications and so on. We know that there, until, until well into the war, there were ongoing U.S.-Russian discussions on strategic stability, of which start as a subset. So I find it to be actually somewhat encouraging to know that they are planning to resume the talks on start because if they, if I my theory anyway, I mean if they can get some kind of communication going and build some kind of confidence even in very small measures, I think it can only help to end the end the Ukraine war. Absolutely. Um, now let's let's talk a little bit about the NPT review conference and your recent article titled "A Four Week Festival of Double Standards, Hypocrisy, and Outright Lying by Nuclear Armed States." Uh, sums it up pretty well, but maybe we can elaborate. What is an NPT review conference, and exactly how horrible was this one? Okay, so as briefly as possible let me say what the npt is the nuclear non-proliferation treaty it was a treaty that was negotiated by the united states the soviet union and the united kingdom the three original nuclear armed states in the late 1960s because the, they were afraid that more and more countries are going to get nuclear weapons so they came up with this idea of this grand bargain that they would encourage countries to to join it to renounce nuclear weapons and join this treaty and they would they and nuclear and countries that had tested nuclear weapons before 1970 could join as nuclear i mean before 1979 could join as nuclear armed states and they the nuclear armed states pledged to end the nuclear arms race at an early date and negotiate in good faith the elimination of their nuclear arsenals so Eventually, there and all other weapons. Pardon me. 
and all other weapons too. General and complete disarmament, but we could have a whole separate discussion about what that clause means in that phrase. But clearly, anyway, some people interpret, some lawyers interpret that to be a, a treaty on nuclear weapons, com, general and complete disarmament. So anyway, um, but anyway, so eventually, the, the treaty entered into force in 1970. Eventually, there were five recognized nuclear armed states, U.S., the Soviet Union and Russia as a successor, UK, France, and China. Almost every other country in the world joined as a non-nuclear weapon state. They forswore nuclear weapons. Um, there are four states outside the MPT now, India, Israel, Pakistan, all of them at nuclear armed, and North Korea, with, which withdrew in 2003, citing its supreme national security interests. Uh, now, there's another, another clause in there, which is that in exchange for giving up nuclear weapons, non-nuclear weapon states are promised an inalienable right to peaceful nuclear technology without discrimination. Well, the, uh, which of course, nuclear technology, nuclear power, it provides the seeds for nuclear weapons. So you're seeding proliferation in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But all those countries are under safeguards from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Just one more thing to, of, in historical note, Iran was the first country to join as a non-nuclear weapon state uh, and brings up the clause about uh, inalienable right to peaceful nuclear technology without discrimination all the time since it, the uh, provision of nuclear power in fact has been uh, provided in a discriminatory manner. But anyway, the, the treaty was extended indefinitely in 1995. Its original duration was 25 years. And there are review conferences every five years to evaluate uh, progress on all three pillars of the treaty, disarmament, nonproliferation, and peaceful nu nuclear technology. And I think as is evident from our earlier discussion, the disarmament part of it isn't going too well. Um, <laughs> the, the nuclear armed states claim that, uh, you know, the, the fact that the numbers of nuclear weapons have been reduced since the height of the Cold War substantially proves that they're making progress towards disarmament and that conditions aren't right, that, you know, Maybe when conditions are right, we'll actually get there. But in the meantime, we have to make sure nobody else gets them and so on and so forth. And, and so most of the non-nuclear states at this point, except for the, the allies, the US allies, um, are, are calling out the nuclear armed states and, and saying, you are not acting in good faith. Where's the disarmament? Um, you know, this is intolerable, um, et cetera. And this was one, one of the, this, this, and there hasn't really been any progress in the MPT now for a number of years. The review conference, the 2020 review conference was postponed because of COVID and that happened in August um, for a whole month. Now, the only good thing is, if you want to call it a good thing, is that all the countries in the world are, are sitting together most of the countries in the world talking about nuclear weapons for a month. And it also, yeah. uh, there's a lot of NGO activity on the side. So this time they, you know, they could not agree on a final outcome document. Um, uh, and, you know, I, my, the title of my piece is how I sums up exactly how I felt about it. Um, but I will say this, I mean, this is interesting that even up until even going into this review, the review conference, the P5 so-called, the US, Russia, China, France, and the UK, who also happened to be the permanent five members of the UN Security Council, we issued a joint statement re reiterating the, uh, or echoing the Reagan Gorbachev statement. And we agree that the nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. So so they, t they come together and make statements like that even while they're engaging in this nuclear brinkmanship as is reflected in this nuclear posture review. So, yeah. so the, failure, the failure of the nuclear armed states to make good on their disarmament commitments in the MPT was one of the 
impetuses that led to the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in, in 2017, which entered into force um, in 2021, and which now has over 91 signatories. But I have to note, and that makes the, you know, the development, possession, acquisition, stockpiling, threat, or use of nuclear weapons illegal, but is not is only binding on those states which have signed and ratified it, and all of the nuclear armed states and all of their nuclear umbrella allies um, have have um, rejected the treaty. Yeah, Jackie Cabasa, we have just a couple minutes left, and I'd love to get your opinion. It's long been my view that new treaties, like the the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, are wonderful things. I'm not against them in any way, shape, or form. I'd love to see it promoted to the hilt, uh, but not a lot, not enough effort goes into trying to figure out ways to compel nations to abide by existing treaties or even to become aware of how strong they are and that they exist. Yeah. And that in a perfectly reasonable, I think, interpretation of the non-proliferation treaty, it requires them to hurry up and get rid of all the nukes and all the other weapons. And in a perfectly reasonable reading, I don't think there's any other, of the kellogg briand Pact, every war on earth is a crime. Uh, and we, we find it virtually impossible to even believe that these things exist, much less get excited and organized around compelling compliance. Uh, do well, you agree they, at all? Yeah, I do. The UN Charter itself. It's the fundamental international law, right? Makes wars of aggression illegal. <laughs> Hello. Um, with key exceptions that are rarely, if ever, well, met, well, but everybody yeah, thinks yeah, are yeah, met. Yeah, and, yeah, you're talking about compliance. I'm just talking about the treaty, treaty itself, which also, so another part of it that's never been implemented is a commission to um, assure that the, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact, the, I don't remember the exact formulation of it, but anyway, it, it says that expenditures on arms should be as minimal as possible while prioritizing, you know, human needs, basically. And that, that's never been implemented either. There, so, yeah, I think I do agree with your fundamental premise. I mean, look at the treaties that the United States made with the indigenous nations, which are being, to this day, violated all the time. Um, part of the problem is that and this is particularly true in the United States, in my experience, is that ordinary people don't know about treaties and we're not taught about them. And, and treaties are regarded like poems or something. They have the same, you know what I mean? A piece of paper with a poem. And that's yeah. not what they are. They really are a viable means alternative to armed conflict and i think if if people understood that better if they were taught that if they thought about it it, it, it could help create a different kind of an environment but that's missing unfortunately and in, in some other countries there's more awareness of that and particularly in smaller countries <laughs> which uh, tend to get left out of the discourse sometimes and the supreme law of the land, according to the U.S. That's Constitution. Right. No, that is absolutely right. Absolutely right. <laughs> and yet one of the biggest holdouts on basic treaties on Earth is the purveyor of the, the rules-based order. So something, yep. something's out of whack. Yep. Uh, we've been speaking with Jackie Cabasso. Jackie Cabasso's numerous titles and credits include Executive Director of Western States Legal Foundation. Uh, Jackie, thank you for everything you do and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.